Welcome to Accessible Art History, the podcast, the best place for art history lovers or anyone that is curious. My name is Annalisa, and I'm going to share an amazing Roman monument with you today. Just a quick reminder before the episodes get started, all sources and images referenced will be posted on the Accessible Art History blog. You can find that link in the episode description, as well as on Instagram at accessible.art.history. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get started. Welcome back to Accessible Art History, the podcast. This week, I'm discussing a site that saw a fair bit of controversy when it was built. Unlike past season subjects like the Via Appia or for Romana, the Domus Aria was not built for the good of the city and its people, but for the pleasure of the emperor. The name of its site means Golden House, and its builder, the Emperor Nero, was determined to make it the most splendid place in Rome. But not everyone was on board with this plan. So to learn more, keep on listening. And a special thank you to listener Laura for supporting today's episode. Before we dive into the Domus Aria and its construction, I think that it's important that we discuss who Nero was and why people weren't so happy with his decisions, including that of building his golden house. Nero was born Lucius Domitus Ahambaris on December 15th, 37 CE. He was the son of politician Gnaeus Dominicus Arabarbus and Arapina the Younger. Both of his parents were direct descendants of the Julio-Claudian line. Through Augustus' only daughter, Julia, Nero was the great-great-grandson of the first emperor and past podcast subject, Augustus. Their family was still quite close to the imperial throne, as Agrippina's brother was the emperor Caligula. Nero's first years were quite tumultuous. His father died in 40 CE, but a few years before, he was embroiled in a political scandal that led the family to being exiled from Rome. Nero's mother, Agrippina, was also exiled for plotting to overthrow her own brother. So Nero's inheritance was seized, and he was sent to live with his father's sister, Domita Lapita the Younger. Within a few years, things were looking up. Caligula died, and Claudius became the new emperor of Rome. He married Agrippina, who persuaded her new husband to adopt Nero as his son and heir. This is when his name changed to the one that history remembers him by, Nero Claudius Caesar Drusus Germanicus. Over the next five years, Nero became a bigger and bigger part of the public roles of the imperial family. But in 54 CE, Claudius was dead. There were some rumors that Agrippina had him poisoned so that her son could take the throne. She heavily influenced him at the beginning of his reign, essentially becoming the power behind the throne. It's important to note that we have three sources for Nero's reign, Tacitus, Suetonius, and the Greek historian Cassius Dio. They weren't too fond of him, however, writing that he spent lavishly while his empire was not financially well off. However, recent analysis suggests that there was a significant deflation at the time, and Nero did spend a lot of the money from the treasury on public work projects. Overall, Nero's reign was not successful in the eyes of history. Early on, his mother eliminated his political rivals, but in 59 CE, Nero turned the tables and he had her murdered. Nero also had his first wife executed on charges of adultery, his second wife died during pregnancy, There are rumors that he kicked her to death, but that's unsubstantiated. And his third marriage was to a young man named Pythagoras, who was said to resemble his second wife. There were two major conspiracies against Nero. The first was unsuccessful, but the second is what caused his downfall. In March 68 CE, Gaius Julius Vindix, the governor of Galla Lugdunensis, rebelled against Nero's tax policies. Other governors soon joined the cause, and it became a major problem for Nero. Although he won a few battles, members of his Praetorian Guard soon joined the rebellion. Fighting continued and eventually the Senate declared Nero an enemy of the state. Nero decided to commit suicide, but then couldn't bring himself to do it. So he ordered his secretary to stab him. According to our sources, his last words were, quote, what an artist dies in me. With Nero's death, the Julio-Claudian line ended. This left a power vacuum in Rome, leading to the disastrous year of the four emperors. I saved one part of Nero's biography for this part of the podcast because it plays a significant role in the Domus Aria story. The Great Fire of Rome burned for over a week in 64 CE. It started in a shopping area near the Circus Maximus on the night of July 19, 64 CE. According to the historian Tacitus, these shops were not only full of flammable goods, but it was a particularly windy night in the city. The wind fanned the flames and caused them to leap across buildings. This was a particularly bad area for this because it was mainly commercial and residential. These buildings were not built of stone like the large temples and palaces, meaning that there was plenty of fuel. In fact, the fire burned for six days, and when people thought it was over, some embers were left behind, reignited, and caused a further three days of destruction. 
According to some sources, looters would fan the flames by tossing lit torches into buildings that hadn't caught fire yet. Some claimed they were paid to do so, but there hasn't been concrete evidence found to support that. Nero was actually not in the city when the fire broke out. He was in the coastal town of Antium. When news reached him, Nero immediately returned to Rome and began relief and rebuilding efforts. In total, three of Rome's 14 districts were utterly destroyed and seven more were heavily damaged. For thousands of years, there have been historical rumors that Nero ordered the fire so he could rebuild Rome in his favorite Greek style. Some even say he played the fiddle while the city burned. And it doesn't help that one of his new buildings was the lavish Domus Aria. But he also had to raise taxes to help pay for everything and started the projects fairly soon after the fire. But with records showing that he led many efforts to help the city, it's hard to believe that he was behind it. Famously, Nero blamed the new Christian population for the massive fire. The religion was in its infancy and Nero needed a scapegoat. So it only seemed natural to blame people that the city was already wary of. In fact, two of the most famous figures in Christianity, St. Peter and St. Paul, were martyred in response to the event. All right, now that we have that info out of the way, let's dive into the Domus Aria. As I mentioned earlier in the episode, the complex's name means golden house in Latin. It was built as a replacement of the Domus Transitoria Palace, which was one of the buildings destroyed in the Great Fire. Whether or not Nero planned the fire, he certainly used the tragedy to his advantage. By building the Domus Aria, he believed that he was creating Rome in his image, transforming it into a Neroopolis. Taking inspiration from the great Hellenistic city of Alexandria, Egypt, Nero wanted to create a city with a balanced square plan. Although the name suggests a single building, the Domus Aria actually consists of an entire 200-acre complex. Of course, there was a main house, but there were also numerous gardens, a bathhouse, an artificial lake, a temple, and a giant 120-foot statue of none other than Nero himself. Next, I'm going to discuss the Domus Aria's construction, reception, and more. But first, let's take a quick break. Hey everyone, I wanted to take a quick break to tell you about what software I use to bring Accessible Art History, the podcast, to life. It's called Anchor, and it's truly made a difference in my mission of making art history fun and easy to learn about. Although I'd always thought about adding a podcast to my content creation, the thought scared me. I'm not an audio engineer or a tech guru, but Anchor makes it so easy. You can use their website or app to record, edit, and spice up your audio with music. They partner with you to make your podcast a success. Not only do they take care of distributing it to all the major platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, but they even match you up with sponsors with no minimum listenership required. It makes creating a podcast easier than I honestly thought possible. But the best part, it's absolutely free to use. As someone who is in the beginning stages of content creation, I'm so thankful to have a free platform that helps me create a quality podcast. If you want to get started on your own podcast, simply go to anchor.fm, that's A-N-C-H-O-R-F-M, or download their app on your preferred app store. Thanks so much for listening. Hi there, my name is Annalisa, and I'm the founder of Accessible Art History. My goal is to bring art history content to anyone that is curious. All my platforms can be accessed for free, but there are ways that you can support the cause. If you enjoy this episode, please consider leaving a rate and review on your favorite platform. I also have a Patreon and a Buy Me A Coffee account set up if you feel inclined to support accessible art history monetarily. However, I will always work to bring content for free because I believe that education should be accessible for those who want and need it. Thank you for listening, and now let's get back to the episode. All right, now that we're back, let's discuss the construction of the Domus Aria. It was designed by two architects named Severus and Seller. They worked primarily in the Hellenistic style, which is likely why Nero chose them to work on the project. Together, they experimented with wide open spaces, allowing the golden sun, a nod to the name, to filter through and fill the spaces. But the sun was not the only gold element. The buildings were constructed of brick and concrete and then covered in gold leaf. The interior of the buildings were equally as spectacular. Many of the surfaces were covered in elaborate fresco scenes painted by the artist Fabulous. According to writings by Pliny the Elder, the artist was very particular about his process and only worked when he felt the light was right for capturing his ideas. 
In addition to the frescoes, the inside of the buildings were also decorated with semi-precious gems and ivory details. One of the most impressive rooms was one that had a circular roof painted with stars and planets. It was built in a way that it mechanically revolved, imitating the movement of the heavens. It must have been an amazing sight to see back then. In case you hadn't noticed from my biography of Nero earlier, the Domus Aria was not well received by the citizens of Rome. I think that Suetonius summed it up well in his work, The Lives of the Caesars. Quote, in no other matter did he act more wasteful than in building the house that stretched from the Palatine to the Escaline Hill, which he originally named Transitoria, the House of Passages. But when, soon afterwards, it was destroyed by fire and rebuilt, he called it Aurea, Golden House. People simply couldn't understand how an emperor could be raising taxes, causing economic issues, and spending so much money on a personal space. The construction of the Domus Aria certainly played a role in the downfall of Nero, and therefore the entire Julio-Claudian dynasty. After Nero's death via suicide, later emperors almost immediately started to dismantle the Domus Aria. Some, like Vespasian and Titus, opened it up to the public once again, though they did drain the lake to make room for their amphitheater. And spoiler alert, that amphitheater is the subject of next week's episode. Titus and Trajan built baths on the site, and a temple to Venus was soon built. The marble, gold, jewels, and ivory were stripped from the walls to raise cash and decorate other public buildings. Part of this destruction was simply practical. If the decorations were no longer being used by the emperor, why should they go to waste? But the destruction was also symbolic. By destroying the Domes Aria, including the colossal statue of Nero, later emperors were eliminating his memory. In their eyes, Nero had quite literally destroyed Rome, and therefore did not deserve to be remembered. By the time that Rome fell in late 5th century CE, the Domus Aria was simply a beautiful but bad memory. However, this wasn't the last that we would hear about the Domus Aria. In the 15th century, a young man was walking on the Escaline Hill when he fell through a hole in the ground. After brushing himself off, he realized he was in an underground grotto decorated with beautiful paintings. After finding his way out, he spread the news. The frescoes were done in the quote, fourth style, which early Renaissance painters called grotesque or grotesque. They inspired artists such as Raphael, Michelangelo, Fra Filippo Lippi, Domenico Ghirlandaio, and Martin von Hemsreck. In fact, a few of these people left their autographs carved into the walls. In the 18th and 19th century, vineyards were planted and the space became a public park. This program continued under Mussolini, who worked to bring back the glory of the ancient city as a part of his power grab. Unfortunately, the discovery of the Domus Aria also led to more problems. Moisture and earth caused decay in both the structures and the art. It's fact it soon became too dangerous for visitors. For decades, the Italian government has worked to survey the structure and find solutions to preserve the Domus Aria for future generations. The Domus Aria was supposed to be a testament by Nero to Nero. Instead, it became a symbol of extravagance and the abuse of power. This fascinating juxtaposition helps us to understand the history of ancient Rome. Make sure to tune in next week when I discuss the Colosseum. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Accessible Art History, the podcast. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at accessible.art.history for updates and keep an eye out on the next episode. They drop every Monday on your favorite podcast platform. If you prefer to listen on YouTube, you can find episodes on there about two weeks after the episodes are posted. Cheers and see you next week.